simulating life in zero gravity. We did some of the work in zero G airplanes, particularly learning how to crawl through that hatch in the Jiminy B. One task the Astro Spies simulated over and over was one of the most basic, going back and forth through the hatch and narrow tunnel that connected the Gemini capsule to the laboratory module. One would go back into the Gemini through this really awkward uh, tunnel. Now, as we progressed on the program, we got better at what we were doing. In an eerie parallel world, cosmonauts were practicing exactly the same maneuvers in Russian airplanes. Even though there was no exchange of information between the Americans and the Soviets, we were thinking in the same direction. We also had a special hatch linking the main unit of the orbital station to the return capsule. To simulate life on board the Almaz, Russian designers built underwater tanks with a mock-up of the spaceship. There, planners had more time to study complicated maneuvers, like loading film capsules into the station. Half a world away, the Americans had developed the same solution. Former test pilot Bud Evans was put in charge of designing the underwater training program. In the airplane, when you reach zero G, and you had maybe uh, 40, to 40 seconds to maybe a minute, 15 seconds at the most. So you really didn't, couldn't get a timeline on how long it would take somebody to do a task. And uh, following that, we went full bore on simulating the bowl astronaut's task underwater. They created an undersea training facility off Buck Island in uh, the Caribbean. Underwater, they dropped this very large mock-up of the mole spacecraft. In film that has never been shown publicly before, you can see mole crew members first putting on scuba gear, then donning their full spacesuits. It was very similar to what it would be in space. Cutting out some of the gravity, you can't move very well. With a more complete mock-up, the Mole crew members practiced more mission-critical tasks, like simulating how to move the packages of exposed film back through the narrow tunnel into the Gemini capsule. We had to know how long these tasks were going to take. This was one way to get some real timeline studies. While both the astronauts and cosmonauts were training for reconnaissance, military planners saw orbiting spy stations as just a first step. Any nation sufficiently advanced in space technology can convert a vehicle into a military spacecraft to deny the use of space to the free world. A 1963 Air Force briefing film titled Space and National Security depicted space as a battlefield and showed just how far the military thought that battlefield might extend. In the 60s, this was a time of big thinking uh, on both sides. The Russians were really thinking grand, and we're talking multiple battle stations in Earth orbit, reconnaissance stations, uh, manned by dozens and dozens of cosmonauts. One of the more amazing documents that we got was um, this list of experiments that were going to be used on the mole. Among those were things that would be considered outrageous today, going up there and capturing or stealing a Russian satellite. Going up there, maybe knocking a Russian satellite out of orbit. Or completely destroying a Russian satellite. Of course we did realize that the Americans tried to develop the satellite interceptors and killer satellites. 
So we decided to develop a special cannon that was placed on the orbiting station. We just wanted to test and see how it worked in outer space. If somebody wanted to inspect or even attack Delmas, we could destroy it. But first, engineers and designers from both sides had to contend with some fundamental laws of physics so that astro spies could monitor enemy territory from 100 miles in space. It's a mystery to most people who haven't flown in orbit uh, what it's like trying to uh, look at the ground as it's going by when you're going uh, 18,000 miles an hour. Just looking out the window with normal or the equivalent of 20-20 vision, you could see tankers, oil tankers in the Gulf of Oman. They looked about that big. You, you couldn't see anything smaller than that without magnification. The magnification system developed for Mole was the state of the art in optical engineering. The camera system and optics, an advanced set of folded mirrors tucked into the station, were so far ahead of their time that a nearly identical configuration is still in use today. So if you picture a Hubble Space Telescope, this huge bus size telescope in space, uh, pointed out at the stars, if you just turn it around and point it towards Earth, that would be the KH-11. We had very high resolution. For photo analysts, it is all a question of resolution. The higher the resolution, the smaller the object you can see on the ground. Extraordinarily, the Moles camera was designed to spot objects as small as three inches. The three inch resolution was pretty critical to providing our people with the technical details of what the threat was and what the capability was. The goal of people who do reconnaissance has always been to get the highest resolution. But it's a trade-off. Tighter you get the picture, the better resolution you get, but the less coverage you get. What you really need is to be able to look at a big scene and say, oh, there's something interesting I really need to look at over there. Inside a mole training simulator, joysticks could zoom the lens both in and out and from side to side. A wide-angle viewfinder could spot targets at the very edge. We had optical eyepieces to look through with ways to point the line of sight and they had uh, simulated, photographs simulated to uh, give you something to look at, to test your ability to zero in on a point of interest quickly and accurately. The camera system was a huge engineering challenge. It required great precision while the target was in motion and the station was orbiting over the poles. They're trying to take a picture of something on Earth. As the Earth is going around on its axis at 1,000 miles an hour, and they themselves are traveling around the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour. It was an extremely difficult scientific task to try to create a, a camera system that could take a very accurate picture, knowing that everything is moving at a different relationship to each other. In both countries, engineers struggled to create rudimentary motion tracking systems. We had other devices for reconnaissance, but we needed to create a control system that could fix the camera on the targets to avoid blur. On Almaz, um, they had a particular instrument which would uh, basically uh, freeze the image. They would actually have the camera move and compensate for the angular distance between a particular uh, point. So as Almaz was flying over, the camera would sort of shift slowly to keep its sights on the particular territory. Mole's tracking and targeting system was computerized, but computing was still in its infancy. And by today's standards, they're really crude. They were IBM 4 pies. I don't think they had 50,000 words of storage in them. You could actually go to IBM, actually went there and watched, uh, believe it or not, uh, these ladies sitting there stringing these little magnetic cores on these wires to form the, the memory of this thing. You've got more on your cell phone, probably, than, than they had in those computers. But orbiting computers and tracking systems weren't what made the mole extraordinary. And the difference 
between the MOL and a unmanned system is that here's a system with people in it. People are, you know, hands-on in the spacecraft, making decisions and adjusting it and so forth. That's